Amy Littlefield is the abortion access correspondent at The Nation magazine. I cannot believe that we have to have an abortion access correspondent. This is a ridiculous dystopian time that we live in, yeah. uh, that we are still fighting these fights and haven't expanded beyond, um, meaning, you know, other issues related to women's health, like like understanding how ovaries work. Because uh, I'm, you know, personally, I've talked about this a lot on the show that like, we're just, I'm shocked by how many of my doctors do not know some very basic things about women's health uh, because no money's being put into it. So, yeah, you know. absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. So, you know, this is a really scary time for uh, the world uh, for a lot of sure reasons. Is. Yeah. And I, you know, I think what's really one of the, the projects of this show is helping folks that may never have to personally deal with an abortion, uh, men in particular on the left and otherwise, understand how it's it's not just about abortion and access to abortion for women, for safety, for economic reasons, for just being able to be a, a woman who could make a decision for herself um, and family planning, et cetera. But it also is a tool, a weapon by the far right uh, which is seeped in misogyny and issues around strong women for so many reasons. And, um, you know, there's, there are these like memes of Handmaid's Tale, uh, you know, all the, all the Handmaid's Tales memes out there. But I, I do think that there's something like in the icon, in the iconographic sense of when somebody is raised with a woman who does not have the ability to pursue their own interests, their dreams, have their own ability to like make choices in life, that actually plays out in the family as well. And like how a child or man in particular deals with women. So it has this cat this 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 effect in the long term. So when you take on abortion rights or 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 um any sort of healthcare related to women, it's actually part of a much bigger project for them in weakening women so that men can continue to essentially, uh, certain men can continue to go without any sort of, um, you know, challenge to their, their, their like thoughts and actions and, and whatever. I mean, there's been a lot of writing about this, but, but part of this is part of the experiment here is it's not just a woman's issue. It's a societal issue. So uh, you, you wrote this piece in the nation, um, about how the Christian legal army, uh, behind the ban on abortion in Mississippi, the Alliance Defending Freedom has been laying the groundwork uh, to end legal abortion for years. And I think that's a great hook in this in that the right wing uses these these moments to mobilize around other issues as well. So tell me, how did you um, decide what's going on in Mississippi? Who, who are these folks? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a great point. And I think it really is important to zoom out and look at what is the wider agenda here? What is the long game? What is the broader plan? And I think to understand that, you really have to look at the group that wrote the bill that is now going to give the Supreme Court its first real opportunity, you know, with its new three Trump appointees sitting on the bench, their first real crack at overturning Roe v. Wade and remaking legal abortion as we know it. Mm -hmm. And so the case that the Supreme Court heard on December 1st, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, has to do with a Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks in pregnancy. This law, as it turns out, was written by the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a massive, in the words of one of its founders, a legal army on the Christian right. And what this organization does, they write model bills. They work with state lawmakers to support those bills and get them introduced and passed. When the laws get challenged, which they often do, they defend them in court. And they have this massive network of thousands of attorneys that they work with or that have been trained by them through their Blackstone Legal Fellowship, where mm -hmm. speakers have included such luminaries as Amy Coney Barrett. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, so it's really important, I think, to unpack the agenda of Alliance Defending Freedom, which wrote this bill back in 2018. And I went back and listened to tape of Alliance Defending Freedom attorneys speaking at an anti-abortion conference back in 2018, reveling in the fact that they had just gotten Mississippi to introduce the first 15-week ban as part of the ADF model legislation, and that this bill was the vehicle that they needed to 
um, proceed with their incremental strategy that was eventually going to allow them to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, of course, after 2018, you know, after that moment, things changed pretty significantly in terms of the makeup of the Supreme Court, right? And they now have a, a conservative anti-abortion majority. Um, and so that case coming up before this conservative majority on the Supreme Court um, means that things are moving faster than they could have ever imagined um, in terms of being able to just ask for an outright um, opportunity to overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, but what I really wanted to do with this piece is zoom out and, and look at what ADF's overarching agenda is, because it's, as you point out, it's not just about abortion. In mm -hmm. fact, this is the same organization, the Alliance Defending Freedom, that is behind the record number of anti-transgender bills that we're seeing in state legislatures. And so it's no coincidence that we're seeing a record number of anti-abortion bills and a record number of bills aimed at, you know, preventing transgender kids from playing on sports teams that correspond to their gender identity or from using the appropriate bathroom, right? These bills are actually being advanced by the same Christian right organizations um, as part of an effort to really enshrine into law this rigid idea of the gender binary. Can, can I ask a question about that? Mm -hmm. When did they start? Were they the original folks who who started this 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 war against uh, the trans community? And and when did it start? Because, I, I, yeah, I, I'm very curious because like they're they're shaping the debate around so many issues right now, right. and right. and essentially putting everybody on. And I, I hate to minimize it this way, but on defense rather than okay, we've moved past this point of society. Now we need to think broader about how as a collective. Um, but but yeah, when did when did they start? It's interesting. They actually started a few decades ago as sort of a counterpoint to the American Civil Liberties Union. Mm. And it was at this time where the Christian right was really looking for um, a hub that would allow it to address a whole bunch of different issues at once through the legal system. And they started small. They started grassroots and they started supposedly with this vision of kind of copying the, you know, liberal model of, you know, which is kind of like uh, absurd to think about now when you look at sort of the way the Democrats are behaving yeah, in their current exactly. Congress. But, but in theory, that's what they were doing. Um, they were trying to sort of create this legal engine um, that would allow them to advance their agenda in state legislatures, in Congress, and through the courts. Um, so no, I wouldn't say that they came up with the idea of attacking transgender people. I mean, unfortunately, that goes back many years before the founding of ADF. But, um, but I think what's happened is that, and I spoke with journalist Amara Jones about this. She does really amazing reporting um, through her organization, Translash. And, um, and there's sort of this pivot happening now, you know, they've, they've always had anti transgender legislation as part of their and anti LGBTQ legislation more broadly, you know, anti same sex marriage, um, they represented perhaps most famously, the Colorado baker who didn't want to bake a cake for a same sex wedding, that was an ADF case. Um, so, so they've always been engaged in these sort of quote unquote culture war issues. Mm -hmm. But I think what's really been happening is this increase in anti-trans bills at a time when they're really sort of getting ready to claim victory on abortion rights, right? I mean, yeah. let's remember the state of Texas has basically been able to ban almost all abortions since September 1st. Um, so in Amara Jones's words, you know, for them, like, the fight against Roe is basically like Roe is dead in in some ways for them, right? Like, uh, so it's a lot the next it's the next organizing mechanism for the exactly. right wing. Exactly, it's yeah. the next front in the culture wars because they're going to need something to rile up their base. You know, once yeah. states are allowed to ban abortion outright. I mean, it's scary to say that, but but I think that is sort of part of the strategy here. Is there um is there a scenario in which the Supreme Court uh does actually side with Roe, right? And and or against Dobbs, right? And another bill is brought to the Supreme Court. It's like, is there another one in the pipeline that's just, you know, because there's there's so many laws that are that are all yeah. over this country and being challenged constantly. Is there right. one in the pipeline that could be the next version of of weakening abortion rights? And and is there a scenario, by the way, in which Roe doesn't get knocked down? 
Right. I mean, there are many, many bills in the pipeline. I mean, yeah. that's been the predominant strategy of Christian right lawmakers at the state level um, for decades is just to advance so many <laughs> anti-abortion laws that the Supreme Court, now that they've managed to, you know, secure a conservative majority on, on the Supreme Court, um, that they will sort of have their full menu of options Mm -hmm. um, to choose from in terms of overturning Roe v. Wade. Now, of course, one of those cases before them has to do with the Texas near total ban on abortion, mm -hmm. which, you know, so far the fight has been much more about, um, you know, the sort of technicalities of the strange civil litigation bounty right. hunter component of that law. Wait, explain that just for folks who are aware sure. of this insane... For folks who haven't been watching, um, so, and, and it's like, it's important to say it, like Texas is still, like it, it was an emergency when this law was in effect for 24 hours, right? When I talked to uh, abortion rights advocates on the ground in Texas, like it was a crisis for them that Senate Bill 8, this law in Texas that bans abortion after embryonic cardiac activity can be detected, right? Which is two weeks after a missed period. This law came into effect September 1st, and that was like an earth shattering crisis. We're now, you know, months in, right? And the Supreme Court has allowed this law to stand. And basically, this law, unlike similar six week bans in other states, has this enforcement mechanism where it's not enforced by the state, which mm -hmm. means that abortion clinics couldn't just sue the state to stop it. It's enforced by your neighbor. Uh, anyone who happens it's like a citizen's state. arrest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's and and it's been referred to as, as bounty hunters, right? Like any private citizen who decides to enforce this law can file a lawsuit against anyone who aids or abets someone in securing an abortion. So that could be someone who drives someone to a clinic, donates to an abortion fund, helps somebody pay for an abortion. You know, you name it. And so, um, so the arguments, you know. Right. So so like, there's this setup in a weird way because these cases were heard right at the same time in front of the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court and and like, you know, we talk about we talk in the future tense often we talk about abortion rights, but like the Supreme Court has had many opportunities to stop this Texas law and they haven't. So mm -hmm. that already tells you what they are doing and have done on on abortion rights. If they ultimately find some way to stop this Texas law and then allow the Mississippi 15 week ban to stand, it could have the effect of basically getting access to legal abortion, but making the Supreme Court look kind of moderate and kind of like they're compromising, right? Because they didn't allow private bounty hunters to sue abortion clinics and you know the relatives of anyone who seeks an abortion into oblivion. Um, um, so what, yeah, that's what, the setup. I mean, in, in, in this scenario, just to, to get into the details a little bit more, like yeah. if someone were to receive an abortion, in, in that case, an illegal abortion from a doctor or, or however, uh, and then something went wrong, uh, which is likely to happen if there is not safe access to abortion, and mm -hmm. then they show up at a hospital because there's an emergency, is that hospital now or the doctor that treats him or the nurse that treats that per that woman in the hospital now part of that 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 uh you know potentially can be you know pursued by a bounty hunter right i mean i think that's the the major question here and there are very few safeguards in this law if any to prevent totally frivolous lawsuits right yeah. to prevent people from just filing a lawsuit to see what happens and even that even the cost of of pushing back against a frivolous lawsuit could end up costing someone, you know, bankrupting someone, right? If they have to hire an attorney and um, fight back against this litigation. And so, um, you know, and and it, and these, you know, copycat bills like the one in Texas have already been introduced in, in other states um, and are being pursued as, as part of, you know, this, again, this strategy of sort of just throwing everything mm -hmm. at the courts and seeing what they will uphold, which has, has been the strategy of the Christian right for years. And, and it's now starting to bear fruit. Um, let's talk about uh, the clinics too, because mm -hmm. simultaneously there's been funding cut across the board for, uh, for women's health clinics, you know, in, in many of these States. So, mm -hmm. uh, it's not just, you know, obviously it was under the illusion that they are, and not always um, conducting abortions in those clinics, but it's also just about women's health. So uh, 
I, I, I was in a debate the other day on Fox News with uh, this woman, mm -hmm. Leela Rose, who is a total nutcase. Uh, she is one of these, these women who just does not quote science in any way. But her argument was, um, you know, was that uh, women are not receiving that, 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 that like doctors under they're, they're making this whole argument like a woman can't with the abortion pills like they should they need to be prescribed by a doctor but the abortion mm -hmm. pills um you know you can get them from anywhere you can get them online and like a, a woman needs to go to a doctor and i said to her i was like well that's that's great but you know you're also cutting access to these clinics so if a woman were to go there's nowhere to go because you've cut so much funding and you've advocated for this not to mention outside of women's health just community hospitals like rural hospitals right. So how does this overlap? And are, is this happening all in the same states? Is it the same folks behind it? Right. I mean, in that issue of access to medication abortion, I think yeah. anti-abortion activists like Lila Rose are terrified of medication abortion, and they're really honing in on it right now. Mm -hmm. So for folks who don't know, medication abortion is, you know, a two drug regimen usually of mifepristone and misoprostol. Um, if people are before a certain point in pregnancy, they go into a clinic, um, they are offered the option between a procedure and you know, taking these pills, which will basically induce a miscarriage and cause someone to pass their pregnancy at home. Okay. And plenty of people prefer to do that. In this COVID and you know, SB8 reality that we're in, a lot of people, like you said, are buying those pills online you can buy them from groups like Aid Access that will ship them to, to the United States from overseas and sort of circumvent um, U.S. abortion laws. Um, and in states that don't restrict abortion, you can get access to these pills legally. Um, often, if you meet certain medical criteria without even having to go anywhere to have an ultrasound, um, you can consult with a doctor through a telemedicine visit and, and have the pills mailed to you. The Biden administration just permanently eased restrictions that are going to make it even easier to get access to medication abortion from a pharmacy or by mail. Again, with a very important caveat, if you live in <laughs> states that will allow that and that aren't trying to ban medication abortion under mm -hmm. state law, which, you know, um, or ban, you know, uh, access to it by mail or, or easy access to it. I mean, which Texas has gotten less attention, but they have, in fact, um, tried to do that on top of um, or done that on top mm -hmm. of, of Senate Bill 8. So um, which is all to say, you know, I think the anti-abortion movement is really looking for messaging that will allow it to push back against medication abortion, because the reality is it's going to be very hard for them to control that right. through anything other than the tactic of criminalizing people who engage in it, um, which, you know, is a major risk, right? Um, but I, I observed this protest outside the Supreme Court. I was there on December 1st um, outside the court when it was hearing arguments on the Mississippi case. And there's a group of activists um, with, with Shout Your Abortion, and they yep. did this direct action where they all took Mifepristone pills, yep. the first pills drug. Now. Yeah. I have it sitting around here. <laughs> and, they, yeah. and they were sending the message like, you know, we're ha we're out here having abortions and and you know we're on the cusp of of possibly the supreme court banning allowing states to ban that but unlike before roe you know these medications are out there and you know and so there are safe options the issue is a lot of people don't know about them and again there is this very real threat of criminalization um before we, we wrap, I want to just ask you a little bit about where the movement potentially went wrong. I know that there's a lot mm. of conversation about <laughs> the last 40 or so years of this this fight and being on the defense. And, and you know, just from my perspective, I think there's been, you know, I think a lot of women's groups, um, there's a lot of conversation about like where the women's group groups went wrong. But I personally feel it's sort of a result of the Democrats, as you said, abandoning, um, you know, any sort of organizing or pipeline building or putting money into state parties or whatever, which, you know, I talk about over and over and over again. But 
I think that folks don't understand these organizations are stronger when you have a Democratic Party that is stronger. And when the Koch brothers are investing, maybe they don't care about abortion, but when they're investing in state parties and taking over state parties, uh, that helps lay the groundwork for more conservative Christian organizations to do the same. Um, when unions are zapped from states, you know, there's less organizing power in those states. So it's it's all these things kind of work together. But but I know you've covered this. So I'm curious, like what your take and what you're hearing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I wrote about this in a recent piece for The New York Times. But basically, yeah. um, I think and and you're right, like there's been a lot of things that have, you know, been involved in the incremental effort to chip away at abortion access and potentially ban it outright that have had have been well beyond the control of, of you know, abortion rights groups, um, including, you know, campaign finance reform and the vast power of the Koch brothers and any number of things. But, um, but I do think this is sort of a moment of reflection for the movement. And I talked to um, more than 50 people who are involved in either observing or participating in the abortion rights movement. And one of the strains that emerged is that the fight for abortion rights has always been in the states, right? Mm -hmm. Since Roe v. Wade, um, the anti-abortion movement really focused on winning at sometimes even the city level yeah. um, and, and the state level and in chipping away at abortion access incrementally through capturing state legislatures. And there just was not a, a push on the other side that could rival that power. Instead, progressive organizations, I think, writ large, and, and Megan Winter writes about this in a really good book called All Politics is Local, mm -hmm. um, that there just was not enough of an effort to push back and build power um, in the states. And you know there was more of a focus on winning federal elections and advancing federal policy. And um, that allowed, you know, the, the courts were sort of seen as there was a, a litigation forward strategy. So, you know, yeah. laws would pass, you know, legions of laws would pass in state legislatures and abortion rights legal groups would sort of target the laws that they could target, that they thought they could win, and they would sue over those laws. Well, you know, that worked until conservatives captured the courts and, um, and you know, managed to come up with this law in Texas, Senate Bill 8, that sort of court proof, at least if you have a receptive audience. Um, and over time, the other thing that happened is those laws, the ones that weren't either weren't challenged or, you know, were able to withstand a legal challenge, they chipped away at access for the most marginalized people, right? So for people in red states who are on Medicaid or don't have health insurance or can't drive for, you know, 12 hours to get to the nearest clinic, the right to abortion vanished a long time ago. Right. Um, and I think, you know, one of the critiques that I heard from a lot of people in, in writing this article is that there was just not the urgency that was needed to defend access for Jeez. black women, people of color, people on yeah. Medicaid, you know, when their rights started being eroded decades ago. Right, right. That's exactly it. Um, Amy, this, I, I, I hope to have you back on soon so we can continue to monitor this. Um, there's yeah, a very big great. topic and I'm just really appreciative that you're doing this work and committing to it. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.